This week's On The Ledge is supported by True Leaf Market, the indoor and outdoor growing experts. US listeners, you can get 10% off your first purchase at trueleafmarket.com now using the code On The Ledge. Whether you want to grow shiitake mushrooms or start sprouting your own tasty salads, True Leaf Market has all the kit to make it happen. Check out their detailed starter guides on the trueleafmarket.com website to guide you every step of the way in your growing journey. So, get 10% off your first purchase at True Leaf Market now using the code on the ledge. True Leaf Market's products come with a 30 day satisfaction guarantee, so I know you won't be disappointed. True Leaf Market, bringing the seed you need. Hello and welcome to On The Ledge podcast, the podcast that makes you passionate about houseplants. I am your host, Jane Perrone, and this is episode 93. This week, I'm talking to a man who is God in the world of carnivorous plants. Peter D'Amato, founder of California Carnivores Nursery and author of best-selling book, The Savage Garden. You all know that I'm addicted to The Houseplant Expert by Dr. David Hesseon, but I have to say I've got my copy of The Savage Garden in about, well, the early 90s when it came out. And this book really was the Bible for me when it came to carnivorous plants. So I was very much fangirling when I interviewed Peter but he gave such a wonderful interview and we ended up going on for over an hour. So I'm going to split his interview into two episodes so you don't miss a thing. And I'll be answering a question about repotting and thuriums. My hundredth episode is looming on the horizon and I want to hear from you. I would love to have some of your voices in that hundredth episode so I can find out what On The Ledge podcast means to you. So if you're the kind of person who's been listening to the show for many months, but you've never actually piped up, now is your chance. Grab your smartphone or your laptop and find your voice app and record me a little message about what the show has done for you. Maybe it's turned you into a total plant addict, uh, caused you to learn everything there is to know about monsters, or made your life immeasurably better through the calming influence of plants. Whatever it is, I would love to hear from you. Just record me a, a one minute or so message on your phone and drop it to me in an email to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com for your chance to appear in that hundredth episode. And I'd also love to know your favourite moments from On The Ledge, which interviews trips out or how to's really made your day. So let me know that too. Again, on the ledge podcast at gmail.com is the place to contribute or drop me a line on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Jane Perone on Twitter and j.l.perone on Instagram. My Patreon juggernaut continues to rumble on. I've now got 120 patrons. Thank you all. And I'm still moving towards my target of 200 patrons before my 100th episode. Am I going to make it? I don't know. But it's the cash from those patrons that just helped me to invest in a new recording setup. So hopefully the quality of the sound on the podcast will be getting better very soon, as soon as my stuff gets delivered. But that's all because of you guys and your donations. So thank you very much for supporting the show. This week, Macaulay joined as a legend. That's a five dollar or more a month patron. And we had a couple of upgrades. Thomas upgraded to legend status and Anthony upgraded to being a super fan. My new $10 a month tier. If you're on Facebook and you're not part of the houseplant fans of On The Ledge group, then what are you doing? Get in there straight away. Answer the three simple questions. Make sure you do answer them, otherwise I won't let you in. And you can become part of an incredibly supportive and lovely community. There is no drama on our group. It's the best houseplant group there is on Facebook. And I say that without a hint of bias, of course. (laughs) It was lovely to hear from my fans in the Pacific Northwest who had a meetup at the weekend and had a great time chatting about houseplants and visiting the Amazon spheres and also hanging out at the plant shop Cultivate Propagate in Seattle. Thanks so much to Cynthia and to Sasha for organising that. And if you're in the UK, remember I'm organising a UK meetup at 
Lullingstone Castle in Kent. On the 21st and 22nd of September, as part of the British Cactus and Succulent Society Cactus World event. I will be bringing you more details about that soon, but do block off your weekend diary for that date if you're in the UK. And now let's hear from Peter D'Amato. Peter was one of the key figures in bringing carnivorous plants to the public consciousness in terms of something that they could grow and love. And his book, The Savage Garden, has inspired many gardeners around the world to think about growing Saracenias, Heliamphoras, Venus flytraps and many more. So I was very excited to talk to him on the phone from his home in California. And I managed to slip in a few listener questions along the way. Well, I'm Peter D'Amato. I started California Carnivores Nursery uh, in Sonoma County, California. Uh, It's about an hour north of San Francisco on the coast in the wine country and redwood country. And uh, I started it in 1989. Uh, I had a rather large collection at the time of carnivorous plants, and uh, there was no place to really buy them. Um, And whenever people saw my plants, they just went bonkers over them. Um, I, of course, stand on the shoulders of many other previous growers, mostly through the Carnivorous Plant Society. Uh, But when I started, when I was in uh, like junior high school, there were virtually nobody growing carnivorous plants more than maybe a Venus flytrap or a couple of pitcher plants, except at like universities. And slowly my collection grew and uh, I went through a job transition. I worked several jobs in my 20s and 30s. Uh, Levi Strauss, and I ran a resort up here in the uh, in Sonoma County, and uh, I decided to uh, give it a try. Um, I started to wholesale commercially grown Venus flytraps in the 80s, and simple, easy plants like Cape sundews from South Africa, and I was wholesaling them to some local nurseries in Sonoma, in Northern California. And then I did a display at the San Francisco Landscape Garden Show. And I hoped that I could pick up maybe a dozen new nurseries to sell my commercially grown carnivorous plants. So many were still being dug up out of the wild. And in three days, about 6,000 people took my card when they saw my display at the show. And that is what kick-started me to actually open a nursery to the public. Well, I'm really honoured to be speaking to you, Peter, because I, as I told you when I spoke, when I first spoke to you, I had uh, the your book when it very first came out. And I really can't remember now where um, it was a gift from my, my boyfriend, then boyfriend, now husband at the time, which I must have asked for because he wouldn't have known to buy that for me. But I can't remember where I first came across you. But I remember that book, The Savage Garden, being a real revelation to me because There was just so much detailed information about how to look after these plants, which was wonderful. So it's a real it is a real treat to be speaking to you today. And I'm sure that you've got tons of interesting stuff to tell me. And I don't quite know where to start. Well, one thing with the book, which is, of course, what's made me worldwide famous with these plants. um, I wrote up a small 16 page booklet that we sold at the nursery for two uh, two American dollars. And uh, it gave, you know, only about a page on each of the main genuses. And we sold about 10,000 copies of that in a four-year period in the 1990s. And then 10 Speed Press, which is now run by Penguin Random House, one of their editors uh, came across the booklet at a party, and he came up to the nursery and uh, asked what books were in print. And I showed him Adrian Slack's book and Dr. Don Schnell's book on the, on carnivorous plants of North America. But there was nothing that was currently in print. And almost none of them, except for Adrian Slack's book, uh, which went out of print very rapidly after he unfortunately had a stroke uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was no information out there. And this gentleman... Uh, He then called me the next day and said he wanted to come up with a contract for me to write the book. And 10 Speed is a fantastic uh, publisher. 
Um, Phil Wood, who started it, created the quality paperback. And the book was very affordable at the time. It was like 20 American dollars. And it won the American Horticultural Society's Book of the Year Award, which flabbergasted me. Um, I just never imagined that, you know, the book would get such claim, such acclaim and become such a bestseller. Uh, then it went through about 14 printings, and I revised it. Uh, and the revision, which I sent to you, was released in 2013. Well, I guess that's one of the interesting things about carnivorous plants is that lots of our assumptions or the general public's assumptions about these plants are utterly wrong. (laughs) As you say, not all of them are tropical plants. Many are temperate plants, subtropical plants come from different parts of the world. What's the biggest kind of misconception that you find people have who are walking into your nursery and they were trying to get their first carnivorous plant? Where do people uh, go wrong with this plant to start with? It is what you just mentioned. Many people think these plants come from the Amazon or, uh, you know, Africa, uh, hot, steamy, shady, tropical jungles. And it isn't true. Um, Sundews and uh, bladderworts grow in England. You know, Charles Darwin fell in love with the plants and became obsessed with them because of the drosera, the sundews that grow there in the moors and bogs of England. And that most of the really popular plants, like Venus flytraps or American pitcher plants like Saracenia, are temperate or warm temperate plants, uh, requiring chilly, even frosty winter temperatures. And uh, they often do excellent in uh, as potted garden plants outdoors on patios and uh, you know, or in sunrooms that get rather chilly in the wintertime. Of course, there are a lot of, you know, subtropical and tropical carnivorous plants, and they would require terrariums or greenhouses that might need some uh, heating in the wintertime. Um, but it really is the fact that these plants are not all tropical uh, at all. Yeah, that is very true. I, it was very helpful in my Venus flytrap episode to have Tom of Tom's Carnivore tell me that, you know, it's fine to have my Venus flytraps outside in the potting shed and that they'll actually benefit from a bit of winter cold. But your answer brings me round to one question that a listener had, which uh, concerns terrariums. And Ashley wanted to know, what does Peter think about carnivorous plants in terrariums? I guess it depends what kind of carnivorous plant we're talking about. Exactly. And uh, in my book, The Savage Garden, I explain several types of terrariums that you could grow carnivorous plants in. And my favorite, and the favorite among collectors over the years, is what I call the potted greenhouse-style terrarium. Many people still think of terrariums with soil at the bottom of the tank, uh, on a windowsill, and often uh, you can't grow all carnivorous plants or even a lot of them in that kind of a habitat, uh, mostly because they would need colder winters. They may require different soils or different moisture requirements. If you keep the plants in individual pots, which then sit in saucers of water, You can make Mexican butterworts go into their drier winter stage by letting the soils dry out. Uh, Butterworts, uh, the Mexican varieties, have sticky leaves from spring until autumn, but then they undergo a dry period. You could also grow Venus flytraps there or a variety of sundews. And if the plant is temperate like a flytrap and needs a three-month, you know, chilly winter rest period, you can remove the plant and put it either outdoors or on the coldest windowsill of your house, perhaps facing north, so that the plant gets the short photo period and cooler temperatures so it could go dormant, and then return it to the tank. Or you can simply grow tropical carnivorous plants all the time in a uh, potted greenhouse-style terrarium. But the second most important thing is lighting. You can do them on a very sunny windowsill. But if you're keeping the terrarium 
covered or partly covered to keep up the humidity. Direct sunlight can overheat a tank, so I strongly recommend using grow lights. And there's many grow lights these days on the market. Um, lighting that they call T5s or T8s that are compact fluorescents or LED lights made for growing a, like aquatic, uh, aquatic uh, aquarium plants work very well on top of the tank for carnivores. So that would be my first recommendation for a terrarium. Brilliant. And just talking about the, the the track record of carnivorous plants, obviously you were t- saying that when you first started out, really these weren't plants that people were growing. What else has changed in the past few decades with carnivorous plants? Are we still worried about people taking them from their native habitats, um, unscrupulous sellers, or, or has that really been knocked on the head by the possibilities of, of micropropagation in a lab and all those kind of things? I think it has greatly con- curtailed the uh, removal of carnivorous plants from the wild. Um, first of all, when it comes to things like Venus flytraps, there are hardly any left in the Carolinas to even poach. But also on the internet, there's so many carnivorous plant societies and forums, and they keep track of this. If there are poached plants being sold on eBay, which still happens fairly frequently, especially with nepenthes, um, which come from Southeast Asia, there's usually quite an uproar about this uh, from the public and from collectors uh, who really try to get this stuff off of the internet um, and prevent people from, you know, selling them. There's so much uh, being done with uh, tissue culture labs. Um, Our nursery, we have our own tissue culture lab, and we're probably producing about 40 to 50 percent of our plants in test tubes these days, although we still use seed and leaf cuttings and division for many, many of the plants. But it is still a problem in some parts of the world. And I would certainly never recommend uh, buying plants that you know were removed from wild habitats. Have you had the opportunity to do any uh, trips to other parts of the world where carnivorous plants are um, live? Have you, have you been to see Nepenthes in the wild or, or any other? No, I've never been out of the United States. And uh, now that I'm older, I'm in my 60s, um, I don't want to. (laughs) The idea of hiking up Mount Kinabalu is not (laughs) something that I would enjoy. I have seen many locations here in the United States. And we are very fortunate in North America to have so many genuses that are native to here. Uh, From the Venus flytrap in the Carolinas, all the American pitcher plants in the southeast and going all the way up into New England and Canada. We have a wide variety of sundews. We have butterworts. We have bladderworts. Uh, here on the west coast is the only place where Darlingtonia, the cobra plant, uh, which is a pitcher plant, uh, it's the only place where it grows. Um, I would you know, have loved in the past to have taken trips especially to Australia, where they have the most incredible variety of sundews, especially in the southwest Australia, um, and as, as well as, you know, seeing Nepenthes in places like Borneo or the Philippines. Um, but now in my old age, you know, I prefer to just watch them on the Internet and see everybody else's wonderful trips that they post as they go out exploring and seeing the plants in the wild. I wonder whether you have a favourite carnivorous plant, Peter. Can you narrow it down and say, this is my absolute favourite, or is that like trying to pick a favourite child? Whichever one I'm looking at, Jane. (laughs) The first carnivorous plant I saw in the wild was a round-leaf sundew, uh, the same species that Charles Darwin became obsessed with uh, in the mid-1800s when he wrote the first book on these plants. And I'll look at a round leaf sundew, and it brings me right back to when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And a friend showed me where these plants were growing, right in the town that I grew up in on the New Jersey shore, uh, in the Pine Barrens. 
Um, but there are so many varieties, and especially new ones that keep getting discovered. Uh, the Nepenthes, it's, it's, when I wrote the first version of my book 20 years ago, there were only about 60 tropical pitcher plants known. Now it's somewhere around 200. And, and they seem to be getting more and more bizarre in, uh, in the way they look and what they do. Um, and there are probably going to be countless new discoveries coming up in the future, which I'm sure will just mesmerize me when I finally see photos and obtain seed to propagate them. Um, for one example, Jane, the island of Palawan in the Philippines, which is northeast of Borneo, and Borneo was always considered to be like the epicenter of tropical pitcher plants. Palawan has hardly been explored for uh, Nepenthes. There's over 200 mountains on that island, and only about half a dozen have been explored by carnivorous plant enthusiasts. Each mountain has a new species that they've discovered. Uh, for instance, Nepenthes attenboroughi. Uh, named after uh, Sir David Attenborough. Um, so there's, it's possible that Nepenthes alone, the amount of species can double. And they're finding, you know, these pitcher plants, you know, with pitchers bigger than our heads. They're huge. Uh, but, I, you know, the, all carnivorous plants just absolutely mesmerize me when I look at them, even the simplest ones. <laughs> We'll be hearing more from Peter after the break. But now let's hear from the other sponsor for this week's show. On the Ledge is also supported by Growth Technology, the nutrient company that helps your house plants thrive. If you find yourself overwhelmed by choice when it comes to choosing fertilizers for your plants, Growth Technology's focus range of plant-specific feeds make it easy to care for everything from bonsai to orchids. Their house plant mist allows you to give your plants a foliar feed while you spray. Growth Technologies fertilizers contain all the essential nutrients for healthy, vigorous growth and are enriched with seaweed and humic acid to support long-term soil fertility. You'll find Growth Technologies Focus products available online and in many good garden centres and nurseries across the United Kingdom. Visit Growth Technologies website, focus-on-plants.com, for loads of great tips and tricks on everything from repotting a Cambria orchid to growing top-class chilies. Choose Growth Technology for happy, healthy houseplants. And now, let's head back to California and Peter D'Amato, and I share with him the strangest listener question I've ever received. Well, I had a question, a couple of Nepenthes questions that, that listeners wanted to have the answer to. And my favourite question about Nepenthes came from Tanya. And she said that she's heard that tree shrew droppings are full of nutrients for Nepenthes. I have a pitcher plant. I also have two chinchillas. Can I recycle their poop in the same way? <laughs> yes, you probably can. Um, in fact, you know, our big greenhouse, you know, we periodically do have rodents come in. And uh, one of our Nepenthes actually did catch a rat a couple of months ago. We were horrified. <laughs> what, you found You found a live rat in the, in the picture? No, it was dead. It drowned. Uh, oh. The picture was huge. The picture was almost two feet in height. Um, but there are a couple of Nepenthes, as Tanya was probably thinking about, that actually produce... Um, a secretion on the lid that is not only attractive to rodents like rats or tree shrews and also birds, but it apparently has a laxative in it. And as the animals sit on the pitcher, and the pitchers are designed so that the animals can actually get a good foothold and eat this stuff that is excreted on the lid, then they defecate into the pitcher. So they're, they're true crapivores. Uh, you know, they, they benefit from the, the uh, excrement of these animals, as well as still catching insects, too. Can you overfeed a carnivorous plant? I mean, if you, if you allow it, uh, say, a Saracenia to just catch flies, fair enough. But if you start putting, I don't know, dead crickets or something inside a Saracenia or allowing your 
your nepenthes to have some some chinchilla poo is it possible to to overdo the feeding you can um and i would you know limit it to reasonable amounts if you have a nepenthe pitcher that's maybe six inches in height um you know putting in about a teaspoon of insect material like every other week would probably be beneficial here in the states we also found that and i don't know if they have it in england uh, but there's a fertilizer for soil for regular garden and house plants called osmocote. They're little pellets. They're about the size of a BB. And people normally mix this in soil for uh, garden plants or house plants. But we have found that just dropping a few of these pit- pellets into Nepenthe pitchers or pitchers of Cephalotus, the Australian pitcher plant, um, causes tremendous growth uh, of the plant. You don't want to add fertilizers into the soil um, because naturally carnivorous plants want very low nutrient soil, purified water, but putting things into the pitchers or on the leaves can feed them very, very well. Another example are sundews. If you're growing a cape sundew on a sunny windowsill, Uh, That's a plant that doesn't require a dormancy. And if you don't have a lot of fungus gnats or fruit flies around, feed them tiny bits of goldfish flakes. Um, You know, the fish flakes that you sprinkle into aquariums. Putting a small amount of that at the end of the leaves on the tentacles, and the next day the plant will be drooling over it. Uh, So there are a lot of things that you can feed the plant that doesn't have to be live, you know, insects. I'm going to so try that with my Cape sundews. That's, that's, an, that's a really great it, tip. It works very, very well. The only plant that does require live insects is the Venus flytrap. The flytrap needs to have those uh, trigger hairs stimulated after the trap closes. If you try to put like a dead insect in a flytrap and you trigger it, the trap will slowly reopen over the next 24 hours because it needs to have those hairs stimulated. Uh, But most of the other plants don't require that, and they can be fed other food substances. Great. Well, that's a really good tip. Uh, When you you obviously see people coming to your nursery and and, and ordering plants and so on, are are Nepenthes the kind of sexy front of the carnivorous plant world? Is that what people are going for these days, or or are the good old Venus flytraps still the most popular, or...? Flytraps are still the number one seller. And then that's probably followed by the Saracenia, the American pitcher plants, because they're also easy in much of uh, our country, as well as much of England. Most of them thrive outdoors in full sun with chilly, frosty winters. But Nepenthes are also extremely popular. Um, However, you need generally humid terrariums with grow lights. Sometimes they do very, very well on windowsills that get some sun, but it does have to be a fairly humid room. And most Nepenthes are highland tropical plants, so they need cooler nights uh, with warm days. Another plant, another genus that uh, we're working very hard with, especially my business partner, Damon Collingsworth, are the Mexican butterworts. Uh, They're flying out of our windowsill because they can be grown like African violets, and they have magnificent, beautiful flowers. Uh, Adrian Slack, who wrote, and he owned Marston Exotics Nursery in the 70s and 80s in England, and he wrote the first good carnivorous plant book, How to Grow Insect-Eating Plants. But he predicted back in the 80s that Mexican butterworts, because they hybridize so easily, he said it was going to turn into a plant as popular as African violets. St. Paulia, um, all the different varieties were produced from two different uh, African violet plants. And both of them had these pinkish purple flowers. Mexican butterworts, they've discovered so many new ones, and uh, we're producing unbelievable hybrids 
which are very simple to grow as windowsill plants. So that's another genus that we've been working with and、uh, are finding to be extremely popular to grow. Listener Steve wanted to know about Pinguicula grandiflora, asking if that is suitable to be kept as a house plant, and if you had any care tips on that one. No, <clears throat> that is definitely an outdoor plant. Okay, it's native to England and Scotland and parts of、uh, Europe, being found all the way down into、uh, Spain. It might be able to be grown as a sunny windowsill plant in the summertime. But it does need a rather chilly, frosty winter, and it's a beautiful plant, and it's actually rather easy to grow.、Uh, it's one of my favorite temperate plants. Ah,、oh, because he has actually says he's sown some seeds, which he's he's got some seeds in the refrigerator on a slightly damp bit of kitchen roll inside a Ziploc, and he's about to sow them. And he's asking they need to be cold in the winter to survive, which we've obviously answered. So, but presumably he can go and ahead and sow those, and just perhaps take them outside for for winter time. Once they once he yes, has some plants, yes, that that would be a good idea.、Um, and they probably the seed probably would germinate on a you know sunny to partly sunny windowsill, or in a terrarium under grow lights. But he will have to take care of the winter dormancy. Yeah. I think that's the thing with carnivorous plants. Many of them aren't that hard to grow if you know these little tips and tricks. And I think the one that that most people fall down on when they go to when they happen to see a Venus flytrap in a big box store or, you know, in a garden centre is the watering. Because oftentimes when you buy them from a non-specialist, the advice on the label is really really poor. I guess they want you to. Kill the plant and then come back for another one. <laughs> I've often wondered that myself. Yeah.、Um, and yes,、uh, but there's another thing too, which I'll mention in just a moment. But yes, the water for carnivorous plants should be purified water, and that means collected rainwater, distilled water, deionized water, water from reverse osmosis units, which here in the states is very popular for drinking water. Um, you don't want to use hard, limey tap water、uh, for these plants, and most of the plants have to be kept rather wet year-round. There are some exceptions, like Mexican butterworts turn into succulents in the winter, which is also their flowering time.、Uh, that's when you keep the soil rather dryish. But the second thing that is where people always well, if they have problems with it. It's due to the lack of sunlight or grow lights. Very, very few carnivorous plants like bright light or shade. They thrive in very sunny habitats, and often a delicate butterwort or a sundew. People think, "Oh my God, it's going to burn up,"、uh, but they don't.、Um, sundews, in fact, were named. They got their common name. Because、uh, back in the 1600s, there was a botanist who said, "The hotter the sun becomes, the more dewy the plant is," and that's true. So, good quality water and very, very high light levels for most carnivorous plants is a requirement. Excellent. Well, another question that came in from a listener was about another genus that I don't think we've mentioned yet, which is Heliamphora. I don't know if I've said that. In the same way that you would pronounce it, but yes, heliumphora. Yeah. Tell us about heliumphora, and then I'll ask you this question of that comes has come in from Bobby. When the first version of my book came out twenty years ago, there were only six species of heliumphora, or more commonly known as sun pitchers, that were known. They come from an extremely strange habitat, which are the Tapui Mountains, mostly in Venezuela. There's over 200 of these mountains, and not all of them have been explored. It's where Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote.、Uh, he placed the lost world on one of these flat-topped plateaus. Now it's in the tropics. It's very near the equator, but the highlands around where heliumphora grow are already.、Um, A couple of、uh, kilometers high, and then the mountains go up several thousand、uh, kilometers above that. 
So the climate is actually cool, wet, and chilly. It's rather similar to a lot of the highland nepenthe habitats. Um, I recommend those plants as strictly terrarium plants or greenhouse plants. They like a lot of sun, and I've never seen really healthy specimens on windowsills. It may be possible if you had a sunroom, and if the room got a little chilly at night, the plant would appreciate that. Uh, but they're a fascinating genus. And when I wrote my book, as I said, there were about six species. Now there is close to 30 known. People are taking helicopters to the tops of these mountains and discovering new varieties. Of course, Venezuela is in such turmoil now that, you know, not many people are getting a chance to go there. Somebody had a question about helium? Yeah, Bobby's question was, he's panicking because he thinks it is time to divide and repot his helium for it, but he's worried about how to do this and he doesn't want to kill the plant. So can you offer him any help? Tell him not to worry about it. Just break the rhizomes apart if they have several grow points. Um, spring is a nice time to do that because the photo period is starting to get you know, longer. But since the plant is tropical, and if you have it under grow lights, you can pretty much do that any time of the year. But remove all of the soil from the base of the plant. You'll see that there are probably attached grow points, and they usually break apart pretty easily. The pictures themselves may be a little brittle, but don't worry about it. Uh, Put the rhizomes into new soil and pamper it with a really good environment. You may want to spray the foliage of the pitcher with a very diluted fertilizer, like an orchid fertilizer. Or if it has pitchers on it, drop some Osmocote pellets or put some very diluted fertilizer into the pitcher. And that will help to give it nutrients uh, to heal itself and then to continue to grow. But it's not really much different than dividing American pitcher plant rhizomes, which is usually with American pitcher plants, since they're temperate, that's usually best done when they're dormant or the tail end of dormancy, which is late winter and early spring. We'll be hearing the second part of Peter D'Amato's interview in next week's episode number 94. But now it's time for question of the week, which comes from Jacob, who has an anthurium that is root bound in its original nursery pot, but has just produced two beautiful red flowers. And Jacob notes, I've never repotted it and have had it for over a year now. So I was wondering whether I should go ahead and do that or hold off since it seems to be doing pretty well. I know that repotting into something more akin to an orchid mix is preferred, but would a standard potting mix with perlite added for drainage also work? Great question, Jacob. I always think of the Anthurium as the Lady Gaga of the houseplant world, never afraid to put on a show, rather glossy and dramatic. So what do Anthuriums need to be happy? Well, if your plant is flowering, Jacob, then as you say, there may be a good argument that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let that plant flower and do its thing. And then once those flowers have finished, then would be the right time to repot. And I think there's a strong argument for that. If your plant starts to look miserable, however, then you might want to go ahead and repot because eventually the plant will start to suffer. Now, potting mix for anthuriums. Yes, these are epiphytic plants. Even the really big ones do grow up in the tree canopy in their native home in the Americas. So adding some orchid bark to your mix when you're potting this on is probably a really good idea. You could put it into ordinary houseplant potting mix with a bit of added perlite. That would add the air pockets and free draining mix that these plants prefer. However, the particle size may be a little bit small. As you can imagine, an epiphyte growing in a tree will have leaf litter coming in there, lodging in the crevices, which the roots then bed down into. We're not talking about very fine bits of soil. Well, we might be talking about some sort of fine soil particles, but there will also be much larger 
particles in that mix. So I would suggest a mix of regular houseplant compost, some orchid bark and some perlite. And the ratio, well, really have an experiment and see what your plant likes. But maybe a ratio of a couple of handfuls of orchid bark, a couple of handfuls of potting mix to one handful of perlite would be a roughly the way that I would go on it. But every Anthurium garroa has their own recipe. So give it a try and see what happens. The other thing to say about this plant is that some growers find success growing Anthuriums in orchid baskets. They're very open, holy baskets that orchids are often put into as a way of emulating their epiphytic existence. So you might want to give that a try. Just bear in mind that obviously you will need to keep the plant moist more regularly than you would do with an anthurium planted in a plastic pot because those roots will be more exposed and will dry out more quickly. But that's what any epiphytic plant is pretty much looking for, is something that gets regularly wetted, but also has the chance to dry out very speedily and the water doesn't hang around. So whatever you do, Jacob, try to emulate that kind of condition and you shouldn't be going too far wrong. I mean, it's also worth saying that anthuriums are a plant that are very popular because they are tolerant. So if you do end up bunging it in normal house plant potting compost, it won't be the end of the world. And, you know, your plant may well continue to thrive. I hope that helps, Jacob. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. That's all for this week's show. Do check out the show notes at janeperone.com for full details on the plants that I've talked about with Peter D'Amato today. Always worth having a look at those show notes because they do contain a lot of useful information tied in with each episode. And that's where you'll also find information about how to get hold of On The Ledge merchandise and much more. So do check out janeperone.com if you have a chance. And before I go, just wanted to give a shout out to my podcast editor, Joff Elphick. I'm going to end the show this week by playing a promo for Joff's own show, Pot and Cloche. It's an outdoor gardening show. That's a fantastic listen. I'll leave Joff to explain the rest, but I'll see you next week and do have a very houseplant filled week. Take care. Bye. Hello, hello, this is Joff Elfrick from Pot and Cloche Garden Podcasts. I speak to head gardeners, garden writers and other haughty types. If Stephen Anderton... I've always described gardening in this country as a bit like an orgy in a telephone box because you don't know where to start <laughs> and you don't know where to start. Or Pam Ayres... I'm poor old grandpa fast asleep was stabbed to death in a compost heap. Or Judith Han from Tomorrow's World... Chalky caught it. I was screaming, but it wasn't in horror at uh, the rabbit. It was the fact that he was sending all my herbs up in the oh, air because no. he was running around all the beds. <laughs> Are your kind of thing? Then you might like to listen to the podcast. That's Pot and Cloche Garden Podcasts. I look forward to hearing from you. Music in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, with ad music from the Heftone Banjo Orchestra, featuring the tracks Whistling Rufus and Dill Pickles, and Overthrown by Josh Woodward. All the music in today's show is licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details. <laughs>